Okay, so our topic for discussion today is detailorizing work. And I'm not going to give more intro to it than that. Jeremy, you can explain what that means and, and get us going. Great, thank you. And hi, thank you all for logging on. And I guess the first thing to say is um, maybe slight apologies for the, the possibly slightly esoteric uh, title. I know detailorizing isn't necessarily the most accessible um, uh, because I'm an engineer by trade originally. I tend to uh, be a little bit technical and use jargon um, but I think it's a profoundly important idea and this this conversation started with the podcast episode that Andy and I did which was a, a really nice kind of quick snappy interview format and I think just a really nice way of getting to the essence of what people really think the world looks like from their point of view and, and how their radical ideas are framed so what, I, what I'm going to do is just give you sort of a five minute provocation um, uh, to try and explain what this idea means to me uh, give you a bit of a definition uh, and then uh, invite us to uh, talk around some questions so most of the time hopefully will be discussion and we'll get us going to and forth we'll keep an eye on the numbers as it might work to split maybe into a couple of breakout rooms to deal with the questions and kick stuff around for a few minutes and then come back. So um, where do we start? I want to start in Edinburgh. Um, this would have been about 15 years ago so I've been working um, doing a real job uh, for, for a number of years. Uh, I've done my MBA and learnt traditional management and what all that was about uh, and then started work as a consultant uh, I got really interested in systems ideas um, and on one of the first assignments I was working with the financial services organization up in Edinburgh uh, working in their contact center so customers were phoning in about their pensions about their investments how much is it worth can I add some more can I take some away I don't understand this document all that kind of stuff uh, and we discovered uh, a thing that I came to call the Janice problem. And the Janice problem was this. I was sat next to one of the frontline staff called Janice, who was quite new. She hadn't been there very long. Uh, and what I noticed about Janice was that she was handing pretty much every single one of her calls off to other members of staff. So after an hour or so, um, I said, this is interesting, Janice, you haven't really been able to answer very many of your customers' questions so far. Uh, and she said, oh, no, it's pretty normal. You know, if you, sat, if you sit here with me for the rest of the day, you'll find that most of this stuff's going elsewhere. Uh, so I said, okay, what, um, what sort of calls are we getting here? You know, they all seem to be people saying, what's my pension worth? can you explain why it's gone up why it's gone down how much i've got in you know said yeah it's pretty much all what's it worth um and other queries like that so janice why can't you deal with the predictably most common question that customers ask you on a day-to-day -day basis uh, well it's because i haven't been trained to deal with those questions yet okay janice why why haven't you been trained to deal with those? What have you been trained in? Uh, well, I spent seven weeks before I was allowed on the phones learning all about products. So we learned all about um, financial services regulations and we learned about the ins and outs of life assurance policies and pensions and all the product rules. But nobody ever taught us how to answer the question, what's my pension worth? Um, <clears throat> so that was an interesting start. So then next day I was spending some time with the frontline managers. Um, and do you think any of the frontline managers knew about the Janice problem? Uh, no. Uh, why was that? It was because the frontline managers were doing a tailorist job, and we'll come on to what that means. But essentially what they were doing was paying attention to how many calls were people answering, how long did each call take, how much time were they spending in between calls, um, in call centre jargon they'd call that not ready time. Um, and how do you imagine Janice looked through that traditional management productivity lens? Uh, the, the answer was Janice looks like she's a really good worker because Janice is getting through lots of calls. She's handing them off. Uh, it doesn't take her very long to do that. She has very quick not ready time because she doesn't have to wrap anything up. She can get onto other calls. So 
that that kind of gave me a clue that what we ought to do is run data for all of the staff in the contact center but do that with the frontline managers and what we did was to stick in in charts over time what people's average handling time was and what we found was three distinct groups in the call center 10 percent of the people looked like janice who were very fast and in the traditional management uh, performance management lens looked like top performers getting through lots of calls about 10 percent of the staff were what the managers thought were bad which was they're not handling very many calls it takes them a long time they spend a lot of time in between calls on not ready and 80 percent of the call center were all sat in the middle pretty much the same over time uh, now who do you think the poor performers were uh, of course the poor performers were the most experienced staff who were dealing with the most complex problems that were being handed to them by the more junior staff and were also acting as the coaches so when janice had a problem and she needed some help she'd grab one of the coaches so the problem we encountered it, it was a really fascinating fascinating insight that i've never really forgotten and i keep seeing this repeating over and over again in lots of different types of ways but essentially the same problem that the managers had a productivity seeking lens and because of that it gave them a completely opposite perspective on the reality of what was happening to the system the people who weren't really creating any value for the customers i.e janice uh, were the top performers and were getting good appraisals and good feedback the people who were, who were adding value to the system by coaching their peers and adding value to customers by dealing with the really difficult problems were the coaches but they were the ones that were poor performers and everyone else in the middle was some days you win some days you lose so the productivity seeking lens had led the leaders into completely the wrong space in terms of what they needed to pay attention to in that system and understanding what really mattered to customers which was just tell me what my pension's worth i want to move some money from a to b i want to increase my contributions i want to reduce my contributions etc that's all you want when you phone up as a customer you want an answer to those questions um <clears throat> now when we when we looked at the system through a what what Andy and I would call a sense making lens what's really going on here it completely flipped the view of value in the system and and you know the reason this made such an impression on me was actually we had I distinctly remember this about six o'clock one evening about half a dozen of the call center managers who were all you know really nice honorable well-intentioned very humane people you know I had a gang of half a dozen of them in tears um, and really upset because it it hit them that what they'd been doing every day was paying attention to people in a really unhelpful uh, and and inhumane way and actually they they had the opportunity to to do something profoundly different so you know lo lots of stuff happened after that um really interesting insights but the, the the impact it had on those individuals when when suddenly the reality of their Taylorist worldview hit them um, was was quite profound. So that that's really kind of one of one of the things that really brought home to me um, quite a profound problem in organisations. We often talk about horizontal fragmentation and specialisation. So this department doesn't talk to that one. We don't get what we need from them. People get handed off. That stuff's pretty much common conversation and and understood to be an issue in organizations i think what's largely invisible is the vertical fragmentation and disintegration so so and again that story really made that obvious to me that even though those frontline managers were in conversation with those staff all day they were listening to their calls they'd essentially been given a job in 1911 by Frederick Winslow Taylor and they didn't even know that that's what had happened so so for those of you that aren't tragic systems thinking and management science nerds like me um, Frederick Winslow Taylor um, the uh, you know so so called father of scientific management I think did two two very interesting things one um, he he 
formalise to a large extent the systematic study and experimentation and improvement of work. Uh, don't have a problem with that. I'm all for that. Um, what the other the other thing that he did that was interesting and I'm uh, uh, less fond of uh, is he made that job of study and experimentation and improvement the job of a new class of person called supervisor or manager. So frankly, uh, pretty much every organisation I come across and we work with, we, we hit this issue that they are tailorist by design. Um, and most people don't really have a clue what that means or who Taylor was. And, you know, it doesn't really matter, to be honest. You know, it's, it's for nerds like me. But, but, but the, I think the pr profound insight is that we have this vertical separation between thinking and doing in organisations. And that has become hardwired into the way that performance management, um, strategy change it development pretty much everything we do in organizations has this vertical separation of duties um, <clears throat> so my, my definition really of, of tailorism or detailorizing work um, is this idea of power control and the separation of thinking and doing being something that's hardwired into our 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 thinking, our behaviour and our organisational structures. And, and that actually uh, is, is not just ineffective, uh, it's also inhumane. So uh, I think, you know, again, my, my background is as an engineer. Um, so I'm, I'm very comfortable with concepts of complexity and systems thinking and organisation design and all that technical stuff. Um, and of course, what I've learned over the years is none of the technical stuff is any use if you don't know how to work with these weird, um, strangely unpredictable and irrational things called human beings. And that, that, that you know, it's taken me a good, well, you know, I'm still practicing, but it, you know, it took me a number of years to, to try and grapple with that weird reality um, that people aren't convinced by evidence um, and they don't do what you suggest that they do, even though you know it's a good idea and uh, things don't go in a straight line from A to B, even though that's obviously the right way that things ought to be done. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, the, the notion of working with the grain of human beings and how we like to operate um, has, has been really an enduring fascination. And I'm uh, very keen on the work of people at like Alfie Cohn. So, um, if you don't know his work, is an American psychologist that looks at the effects of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So extrinsic motivation is when we do things to people to try and get them to do what we want. So uh, punishment, rewards, appraisals, rating and ranking, all of those types of things are extrinsic methods of motivation. Uh, the psychological research tells us that those things actually damage performance as well as motivation. They're bad for people. Uh, intrinsic motivation is when we have um, content, so we're interested, we have the opportunity to collaborate, and we also have choice and control over what we do. And Dan, Dan Pink is the sort of slightly more TV-friendly version of Alfie Cohn. Um, so he'll, he'll talk about the same stuff. Um, and I think that's really in tune as well with the idea of trying to detailorize and rehumanize organizations. So, so we, we're giving up the idea of being in control of and having power over uh, and thinking about how do we um, distribute power, distribute control and, and reintegrate thinking and doing. And how can we hardwire that into our institutions and organizations so things like uh, decision making processes you know management boards oversight funding you know there's a huge range of things that we essentially are still operating tailorist um, norms and processes so um, I to my little five ten minute provocation um and and ping over to you 
uh, three questions. And I think just to get a view, first of all, whether um, it might be useful to do that in breakout rooms first, because I think we've got um, enough where it would probably be good just maybe to have a couple of breakout rooms. Um, so if I if I ping you the questions now and then we can bung them into the chat, uh, Andy will do the technical wizardry and, and send you off into some breakout rooms. Um, probably worth just sitting in there, I would say, for sort of 10 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll come back and, and do some sharing and reflecting and ask questions. And um, it would be great if you guys uh, could share some stories and questions and, you know, by all means, um, some challenges and provocations as well. So I, I tend to be uh, of the school of hopeless optimists and, and deep pragmatists at the same time. So I'm, I'm, I absolutely hate the idea of top-down hierarchical ways of working in organisations because to me that feels inhumane, but also the engineer in me knows that it's ineffective so I hate it because it doesn't work very well uh, and I also dislike it because I don't think it's good for people. Um, so I'm hopelessly optimistic that we can detailorize and rehumanize our organizations but I'm also deeply pragmatic that you know, this is not going to happen overnight. Um, uh, you know rev revolutions usually turn out quite badly um, you know, we can create a massive change overnight, but then the revolution revolutionaries tend to turn into autocrats. So, you know, we might need to do this incrementally. Um, often this this is uh, one person at a time, one problem at a time, one team at a time, one organisation at a time job. So uh, I think we have to be dead pragmatic, but I'm also a hopeless optimist. So I will continue to bang on about this. Um, and uh, be dead interested to hear your thoughts and as I say quite happy for you to tell me that I'm being uh, not just hopelessly optimistic but wasting my time as well. So, <laughs> so here are the three questions um, if you're happy to share and discuss. Um, I would be really interested uh, for you to talk about how, how tailorized you feel your organizations are right now so this this isn't a value judgment it's more of a reflection on you know where where do we think we've got the most sort of hardwired and unhelpful tailorist separations of duty so how tailorized is is your world right now um what are you doing to rehumanize your your systems or your work and that could be for example uh, you know, not just your work, but, you know, I, I got myself elected as a school governor a few years ago in my kids' primary school on a on a um, very explicit sort of anti-Ofsted, uh, anti-national curriculum, uh, anti-grades and targets ticket to say um, all of those things exist and we're not going to pick a fight, but those things are outcomes and what we ought to focus on is teaching and learning in this school and supporting parents and young people and the staff to do a really really good job of teaching and learning because I believe that all of those things will tick all of the boxes without us even having to worry about it. So I, I invested time and energy in in helping the school to de-emphasize Ofsted and grades uh, and focus on um, growth mindset work and all sorts of stuff like that that was beginning to emerge so it doesn't have to be work it could be you know what what are you doing to try and rehumanize the world and get us away from 19 1911 management technology um it's you know it's, it astonishes me it, this is just a slight tangent uh, and a, a forgive the rant but because i because i did an engineering degree originally uh, it sort of taught me that you should work things out from first principles and you should be able to test things out with the scientific method so if you if you if you're building an aeroplane or a bridge or making an engine uh, there are some sums that can help you do that and you can prove that those sums work in a lab uh, and you can base what you do on some theory and then I did uh, a master's an, an MBA and discovered that most of what I was being taught wasn't based on any evidence or research or theory at all um, it was it was quite scary so 
you know, essentially we're still running 1911 management technology in our organizations. Um, I, I know doctors, you know, not, not everything in medicine's evidence-based, but there's not that much 19. <laughs> a lot of it is, and not everything is, <laughs> you know, I, I'd be very worried if, if all of our, all of our medical technology dated from 1911 or our pilots were still, you know, so it's one of the weird fields that I think is the management seems to be very resistant to uh, 21st century uh, technology. So what are you doing to rehumanize and detailerize your organizations is the second question. Um, and the third question for discussion is what help do you need? And that's not necessarily what help do you need from me, uh, far from it. Um, just what help do you need? Um, so those are the three questions. Um, Andy will throw us in some breakout rooms. What do you reckon? 10 minutes, 15 minutes? You should. No, I should. saw Bill say something, but I couldn't hear him. Should we, should we say 15? Because there's a bit of stuff to get our teeth into there. So if, uh, 15. Yeah. How many rooms did you want, Jeremy? I reckon, should we just go for two? Okay. Uh, I think two rooms in 15 minutes should do it nicely, shouldn't it? Yes, lovely. So I'm just setting that all now. And, and are we ready to rock and roll? Throw it in, it'll throw us out automatically when our time is up and give us some warnings. Yeah. So, okay, folks, uh, we'll see you in 15. Uh, yeah, just over, really over to you guys just to, to ask some questions. If you have any or or share some reflections on what you talked about in the breakout um, and um, we've got 15 minutes or so just to uh, to kick that around we, we had a really interesting conversation with Judy and Stephen um, I'm delighted to report that um, Judy's organization is the second organization that I've come across in the last couple of years that is scrapping their appraisal system uh, and getting rid of rating and ranking uh, and moving to uh, why don't we have some intelligent grown-up conversations between two human beings about uh, what do you need to do a good job um, so that's that's a heartwarming bit of news um, that would have been my my second go-to topic would have been performance appraisals <laughs> my lifelong mission to scrap appraisal systems um, but yeah over to you now that the printer behind me has stopped so, so my question so we we did this we saw a window of you know the hr director's left the new one hasn't come yet um we're talking about you know culture we're talking about not being a bullying organization anymore and it just felt like there was this window of opportunity and we jumped into it but that's that window's not open at the moment how do i reopen the window Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> I, lo I love the audacity of uh, just leaping on the opportunity, changing something, and then when the new HR director turns up, you just go, well, this is just normal. Yeah, done it, be late. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, any suggestions on how to create windows? I'll chuck one in just for what it's worth because this comes from an email I actually had literally yesterday <laughs> about something similar and long story short I think the conclusion that we drew in the conversation was um, to start by starting so what I mean by that is um, we kind of had this quite involved email conversation about how different the world could look and when we'd worked through how different it could look, it, it's just too big, it's too scary. You couldn't get anyone started there. Um, but actually, um, if you just sort of rewound in the email chain, what you found was the first thing to do was just start by having some sensible conversations. Start by doing things that are within our scope of control. And, and so the conclusion was start by starting and, and see where it leads. And I think see Saskia's put in the chat, you know, the pandemic has, has definitely created lots of opportunities. And I think it's um, it's it's well worth, you know, thinking along the lines that Judy has, which is 
we know we've got something here that will create sort of an incremental shift in the culture and practice in the organization so we'll we'll find opportunities to sort of winkle that in somehow or other and, and for sure i think the pandemic has definitely uh, opened that up because it's given people real permission to act more autonomously in in a lot of places hasn't it i think the the other thing i'd i'd throw in is um I, I, there's a book um david marquette called turn the ship around which is quite an interesting read uh, and, and that one of the things i took away from that was he he basically spent a lot of time opening windows so he was just always looking for opportunities to do things to affect the culture uh, on his submarine so his his end game was to break down the culture from being a leader follower culture tailorist to a leader leader culture where much more distribution of decision making and responsibility so he he just was constantly on the lookout for opportunities and would then bend that opportunity to his long-term goal so uh, and I, I guess the other thing about opening windows is sometimes um to to not necessarily wait for an opportunity but just create an opportunity by doing something coercive so um for example one of the things that, you know that david marquette did was just to you know mandate that he would no longer make decisions on leave on the ship so what happens all the decisions on leave would go up the chain of command and he just said i'm not doing that anymore um the the smallest sort of unit on the boat so catering or you're in charge of the torpedo tubes you're now responsible for figuring your own leave out because he knew that that would lead them to problem solve and work out ways to coordinate with each other. And uh, you know, I've, I've seen an ex-colleague do that when he became the ops director in one of the energy companies. He, he walked into their contact centre that was just full of repeat calls and customers with problems with their bills and stuff getting handed off from the front line to the back office and that generating more and more and more and more work. And he just mandated that nobody was allowed to hand a customer off to the back office anymore they had to keep hold of it and resolve it preferably during the call and if not they had to grab someone from the back office to come and help them fix the problem for the customer um, and people thought he'd lost his mind they thought he was a, a complete idiot he had no idea what he was doing there was uproar he basically had to you know hold people's feet to the flames for a fortnight and then after two weeks, everything started to calm down. The volume of calls dropped. There was less complaints. Customers were happier. There was less work. Things were starting to work more smoothly. The whole thing calmed down. And, and it would never have happened if he hadn't have made it happen. But, you know, that was a big, you know, two or three hundred seat call centre, big operation. Um, uh, but he was only able to do that because he knew it would work because he'd done it somewhere else before. So I think opening windows uh, is often about you know maybe you know not being frightened of being a bit coercive sometimes so kind of kick the door in rather than wait for the window to open <laughs> but don't be coercive unless you know it's definitely going to work <clears throat> i just chucked in the chat two very quick other thoughts um hmm. So the, the second of them first, yeah. I think the whole reason we have Next Stage Radicals is actually to try and share stories of this stuff so that it stops being something different and scary and just becomes another option that's open to us. So, um, so it doesn't have to be on Next Stage Radicals, but you'd all be very welcome to share stories there. But, but I think sharing yeah. stories is good. Um, and sort of in the same spirit just treating it as completely normal can be powerful. So, so one way to make that concrete is that we often, I think, think of this work um, almost looking up the hierarchy, um, but very often it's useful to just look at ourselves or, or if we want to talk in hierarchical terms, sort of look down through the hierarchy as well and, and ask ourselves, well, why wouldn't we just assume that everyone would be thoughtful in their practice, taking responsibility for the consequence of their actions, etc., instead of allowing um, a kind of continuation of well if i just followed the rules that's me done my job yeah you know uh, so no. I think expecting people to have um thoughts about their work information about their work be making decisions about their work i think can be really powerful yeah i, th I think that another really 
a simple tactic around that behaving normally is when when a problem comes up that people want to talk about in a meeting you know so we'll escalate that to the board is, is to just act as though it's completely normal to say well, why don't we all just go to where that problem is happening and have a look and go and find out together so uh, you know Jap the japanese call it going to the source so just act as though that's totally normal and say well why would we sit in a meeting talking about this why wouldn't we just go to that ward or that part of the factory or that that depot in the housing repairs service and go and have a chat and see what's going on uh, and uh, as i say i think just just act as though that's totally normal and don't pretend that it's something weird and different <laughs> So that's the thing with the new HR director, Judy, is just everyone behaves as though, you know, of course, having these intelligent relationship building coaching conversations. Yeah, that was done. yeah. You know, why, no would turning you wanna, back. why would you want to give somebody an arbitrary score? That's just going to demoralise them and make them an idiot. I'm not going to do that. You know, what yeah. we did normal. <laughs> yeah, there's no, luckily, there's no going back on this one. It's too far down the line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So any any other thoughts on um, what what you've been able to do or what you're planning to do to help you detailerize and rehumanize or what or what help you might need? I think what you're describing about kind of thinking about how can I tactically lift the lid on this, you know, so I can see that there might be a disconnect and that, you know, maybe your frontline call handlers can't answer all the questions. Sometimes having a conversation about that in the background, people will just deny it or say, well, no, I can't be true, I can't be right. So that kind of tactical, okay, actually, I'm going to show you. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow, without you knowing, I'm showing you, but you're going to come out of this having seen it. And yeah, that, that just has so much impact when you get that right. Yeah. Um, Is it um, so much more than if you just tell people about it? I think, I think it's, um, I listen to uh, occasionally the, um, is it Mayo and Camo doing their film reviews on Radio 5 they're, they're constantly talking about show not tell so you know good filmmaking the director shows you they don't tell you and that it's the same principle you know find think about how can I get somebody to see this to hear it to have a physical and emotional experience in a way that they don't feel manipulated that it's not condescending if something horrendous is happening that's on someone's watch you're not rubbing their nose in it I mean I, I saw this in a housing association years ago where you know quite legitimately the ops the ops director was saying look I, I see all of this issue in terms of the processes that we've dug up in the repairs system um, but I just don't understand why our customer satisfaction is so high um, so so we said okay well let's just go to where customer satisfaction is worked out and there was a lady in the office going through all of the customer feedback forms and she didn't know really who the ops director was you know he asked her can you show me how we compile our customer feedback and satisfaction data he said yeah we get all of these feedback forms sort them into a pile here's the pile of unsatisfied here's the pile of people that are satisfied and immediately unsatisfied was bigger than satisfied which isn't what he would see in his meetings uh, and he says so what i do is um, because we've been given a target of 95 percent customer satisfaction i then go through all of the unsatisfied ones and figure out which ones i think are legitimate and if I don't think that they're actually a legitimate complaint, I move them into the other pile <laughs> and eventually we end up with the right number. And the, and the ops director was sitting there going, I created that target. Okay. You know, and th that just sort of emerged, you know, so, and then the thing is don't rub the nose in it, you know, don't be clever, just go, okay, well, now we know. So let's figure out a better way of understanding how satisfied our customers are. And is that relevant and useful? So, uh, you know, just, I think, and I think it, another great thing I've learned from a, a colleague um, who, who was ex-military, he always used to say, time spent on reconnaissance is rarely wasted. So go, go and do a recce, go find out how the customer satisfaction numbers are compiled, go find out how this works, do the bit, do the going to the source so that you know what someone's going to discover when they get there. Um, so you're not tricking people, but you're you're making an environment where it's going to be conducive and they'll learn. They're not going to get beaten up and, you know, you'll be able to process something. 
and and some, sometimes that can have a really profound effect um you know one person at a time one problem at a time but you can you can get some real breakthroughs with that so yeah that's a great a great shout Stephen. yeah never trust your customer satisfaction numbers never trust the color of the traffic lights in management meetings somebody somewhere will have been frigging the numbers or the system to make the traffic lights go green <laughs> so that's often a good way of opening the window is showing people the reality um, that green is red and red is green <clears throat> yeah, good what else what else do we have I've been, um, I had a great discussion with um, Karen Sasky about using nature models. Ooh. So I'm writing a book at the moment on sense of place and nature and how nature doesn't waste anything, how it doesn't have an agenda and how it reinvents itself every day. So why couldn't we build a business like that? Yep. So, and it's, how did you know I work, I ran a call center and worked in a housing association, Jeremy? I, 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 the, the call center was just fantastic. This happened to me on many occasions, so I know exactly where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? And it's so hardwired, and I think it's because, again, when you see it's coming from that productivity-seeking sort of control mindset, you, you see it repeating everywhere. So, again, it helps to not be cross with the people. You know, you can then be hard on the on the the organization design but soft on the people um and you know i used to get incredibly frustrated about how daft people were because they couldn't see this stuff until i realized well of course they can't see it it's normal everywhere um we've got to be much kinder and as you say i think those notions of how we create much more uh, emergence in our organizations and adaptation i think that's very in tune with with nature and, and actually with human nature as well. Um, you know, so many of the things that happen in organizations are in emergent phenomena and learning how to um, organize emergence, uh, I think is helpful. Judy, ah, Judy just said goodbye. She had to run. Uh, I think we're just watching the, uh, time there. The next, got the next meeting. Uh, yeah. Just really briefly on Bill's point, um, I came across a phrase recently by one of our fellow Next Age Radicals, Alex Patworth. Uh, he, he started describing his work as rewilding organizations, which <laughs> I absolutely loved. So I'm just going to put a little link to his blogs and things in the, the chat, but he's going to be speaking on one of these in, I think, two months' time. Um, it's worth looking out for. Yeah. I think the, the, the fascinating thing is that so many of these notions come from the, the root of you now understanding the complex reality of how we organize ourselves as people into these weird things called organizations. Um, so, you know, Alex talking about it is rewilding me talking about it is detailorizing. They're all, they're all coming from the same, the same route that recognizes the, the real, complex systemic nature uh, of, of how organizations really work and we've just kind of crashed this top-down pyramid with this artificial vertical separation on top of it and, and almost separated human beings into two different species um, and I you know there are often people who do you know white collar work and only think and never do anything physical and 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 people who are required to do you know manual work and never think um, and you know people in the, in the middle but you know you see that as a real a real issue in the way we think about organizations and about other human beings so yeah, yeah I that's my I radical to, um, idea <laughs> i have to briefly point out another link for you because i think it's so opposite uh, if any of you listen to in our time uh, the radio 4 broadcast there's one on there which is exploring and uh, this is sort of dynamite but um it, it's exploring uh essentially how did uh the holocaust come around um and one of the key insights from this particular uh broadcast i, I tried to find the link but i'll, I'll uh, send it out afterwards is that um 
the lady that's talking talks about how uh, what happens in atomized societies is we um, start to delineate the kind of conscious self from the bit of meat that we are uh, and that makes it really easy to kill us because we just say oh we're just killing bits of meat um, and so what's what's really peculiar about it is the way that actually when you listen to this uh, podcast you, you'll hear how sort of insidious the process by which that happens is and what's particularly scary about it is that um, you can see a lot of that going on at the minute in the world uh, but you can see an awful lot of it going on in our organizations and it, it's sort of shocking to say it you know I don't want to sit here and say that makes managers you know the equivalent to SS officers but on a diluted level the, there's the same logic going on it's really quite extraordinary so I'll share it with you in case you're interested but uh, have a stiff whiskey or something next to you as you listen to it you know <laughs> But that's all about distrust and mistrust in the workplace. I was just saying, H&M have just been fined £35 million for spying on the staff. And it's happening more and more. You know, we need to have a new contract if we're working remotely. And that's not even been talked about. If you're going to be working from home, is your structure all right? And can you imagine you doing a performance appraisal on Zoom? That, and that'd be just amazing. <laughs> you failed zero on... I mean, it's frightening. I, I've, I've got a whole podcast on that. I'll send it to you. It's really, really fascinating, isn't it? We, we've, um, I mean, I've got quite a few ex-colleagues who are working in Lloyd's Banking Group. A lot of them on the technology and transformation side. I was talking to one of them a few, few weeks ago. And their experience during lockdown with everyone working from home in Lloyd's is that their uh, technology and change teams that had generated really good self-management routines and agile working methodologies are much more autonomous. If they'd done that pre-lockdown, they became even more productive during lockdown because they were released from everyday management oversight. Um, the teams that hadn't established that actually became less effective during lockdown because they were essentially just in the wilderness and were unmanaged. Um, it's a really interesting phenomenon, but I think it's a signal um, that you know that managers trying to reassert their control and dominance is is definitely happening, and and actually will be incredibly counterproductive because uh, you know I certainly know through experience every team I've worked with where we've increased autonomy, but given that structure, um, has has ended up being happier and more effective and more efficient human beings flourish in those types of environments um so i think uh, yeah it's very it's 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 worrying in it but i think uh, you know some organizations are definitely going to go down that route aren't they so i th i think i found the podcast uh so that's it in the link but check it out if, it, if it's wrong i'll let you know um Jeremy, I'm sorry, I'm conscious of time and we're just a few minutes over. Yep. Um, any final thoughts? No, nope. good. We're done. Okay, folks, thanks for joining us for that. I think, um, you know, inevitably with a topic like this, no easy answers, uh, but hopefully useful discussion and a bit of fellowship to be had there. Uh, I'll share the video from this and, and the links that were in the chat and so on afterwards. And uh, Thanks for coming along. We'll see you again in the future, I'm sure. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks, Jeremy. See you all. Take care, guys. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.